Sit next to Saloni. We can cut down the last row. All right. Okay, guys. So let's start out with. Uh, I need to make a change. I put that in the uh, video for the previous class as well. So the information. This is just contextual information. The information I gave you about uh, the sugar contract when I was kept on saying it's actually listed on the the NIBOT is a part of the CME group. Come in, come in. Uh, just wave people in, Vishali. Just wave people in. Don't no need to ask whether you want to come in or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, the information I gave you was uh, actually not wrong because it's not a part of the CME group. It's a part of the um, of the, of ICE. Okay. There's this other exchange called ICE. I told you intercontinental intercontinental exchange, which is now just called ICE. Okay. They have a lot of contracts. Uh, so uh, this is actually this is where the sugar futures are. Okay. So it's just a matter. You have to basically you have to be aware of all the major exchanges in the world and so uh, in this case um, I was um, under the impression so if it's not on the CME group it's likely to be on the ICE because ICE is uh, the other major big exchange and so the question here really was I was a very long answer to your question okay I hope you didn't get confused by the answer you you got the answer that you wanted okay I gave you a very long answer because I was trying to look at it from the point of view how would you know I added to a question her question was really how would you know that it's a futures price okay but I added to that question implicitly by saying uh, that I've also added this other question how would I know that SB is the ticker for sugar yeah. because I was trying to enter the sugar price uh, I wanted to see the sugar price feed and uh, I just entered SB because I know from having uh, dealt with this contract before that I know that SB the th thing stuck in my mind so I knew SB but how would you know normally is that you the process you would go through is you would know which exchange it's listed on okay so eventually you I mean in this case I had the wrong impression because the CME group uh, there was a time when they bought a lot of exchanges so I had the feeling that they bought the NIBOT as well but actually that was part of ICE it's another ma major exchange so you try with CME group if it's not listed there actually what we saw there is a cash settled contract but the main sugar this is called the world sugar uh, contract okay because as you can see here the deliverables against look at the kind of con in this sugar contract, when we do futures contracts, yeah, when we do, just wave people in, buddy, just wave people in, bro, so they don't have to ask whether they want to come in or not, uh, whether they can come in or not. So you can see how many deliverable growths can be delivered against the sugar contract. When we look at futures contracts in detail, we will see that this is what happens in a lot of the futures contracts that you can actually deliver against them. Okay, so if you trade in the sugar futures contract, if you're short, then you can actually fulfill your contractual obligation. Remember, short is a contract to sell so you can fulfill one of the ways you can fulfill your obligation is by delivering physical sugar okay against your short position and these are the growths you can even India is listed here you can see that okay but it has to be delivered uh, they would have mentioned something about the inco terms um, at a port in the country okay okay fine so this uh, yeah FOB have you heard this term before no. FOB you guys gotta learn this stuff okay these are called inco terms I'm gonna write this down in your session notes so you have yeah okay so this stuff is called uh, so this is just some in introductory so the first thing is that the information about uh, this is 177 the information about this being NIBOT being a part of the CME group was wrong it's actually NIBOT is a part of this uh, of the ice okay the ice is in ice is no longer a full form okay okay that's your I'll set another alarm so that Garvit doesn't get restless. <laughs> 11 a.m. <laughs> no, no, it will. Uh, yeah, okay, good. So, um, what we are going to do now is I'll just. Uh, I'll just complete this instruction okay so these are in quote terms you got to basically this goes into the realm of things that you guys have to study on your own okay in quote terms these are called internet in quote terms essentially is international commercial terms okay so look up the ICC website okay the ICC is the International Chamber of Commerce it's not the International Cricket Conference or whatever so it's it's um, the International Chamber of Commerce okay so ICC uh, these are all the things that you guys have to look up all these things are connected 
the United UNCISG again you can google this stuff okay it's all there in your session outline so this part is this is in your folder you don't need to note the keywords okay I'm writing it down here you need to note the instructions this folder this file is in, going to remain in your folder okay uh, so this is stuff that this goes into the domain of what you guys have to study on your own remember you're in a professional program we are not going to spoon feed you I'm like your coach some stuff I'm going to work on you uh, work with you uh, live on, on some of the stuff and other stuff I'm just going to tell you you got to do it on your own okay as, a, as a, if you really want to excel as a finance student you have to take the uh, take the ball and run with it on your own because we don't have time in the curriculum to teach you all this stuff I personally think this should be part of our curriculum it's very important stuff what is the UNCISG? UNCISG is the United Nations Convention for the International Sale of Goods. You don't have to note it down because you can Google it and see it. Okay. But ICC is the International Chamber of Commerce. So they, this is basically whenever you have international sale of goods, this should be part of your, uh, you know, global business or whatever other kind of uh, international business kind of curriculum. Okay. Very important stuff. And then you have, so whenever there's an international sale of goods, you have, uh, basically most of the stuff is done on LCs have you heard of LCs letters of credit okay so many of you might be going for some of your seniors like Solanki and uh, who else has gone into a, uh, one of the girls has also gone into HDFC working capital group essentially they've gone into a classic uh, relationship banking wholesale banking rule uh, role okay where one of the things they're going to be doing is basically kind of going to customers and trying to sell HDFC bank the classical commercial banking products like loans guarantees LCs okay so one of the products they're going to sell is LCs letters of credit so you've got to be very very it's a very technical subject you've got to be very familiar with this it's your responsibility to learn if you have any questions you can come to me but it's your responsibility to learn this all this stuff you must be a master of LCs I remember they didn't teach us in I am Ahmedabad when I went to American Express Bank for my first job we had rotations and when I went to the trade finance department they were telling hey, well, I am the I am Ahmedabad you don't know what LCs are okay so uh, so so you should know what LCs are okay by the time you go for your first job you should know the whole product inside out it's a very technical product so I'm let me just write it down uh, letters of credit actually this the, the full name is uh, okay let me just write it here UCP 600 this is this is also you can UCP stands for UC, uniform customs and procedures okay so UCP 600 is the latest version of the document so understand the connection okay the United Nations Convention for the international sale of goods covers is the legal framework governing the sale of goods international sale of goods most of the countries have signed up many many countries globally have signed up for it okay so I'm not sure about India what we have done maybe we haven't signed up for it I'm not sure we have to check it okay you can check it on this website who has signed up but many countries have signed up okay so once you have a sale it's governed that's a legal framework there's a further legal framework covering letters of credit okay so when I'm if I'm a Japanese exporter selling to an importer in Tanzania I may not trust that importers credit okay I don't know if the guy is gonna pay me so he will say I'm not gonna pay you unless you open a M in LC in my favor okay so you can read up all this stuff so that's how the shipment gets done that guy the importer has to open an LC in favor of the Japanese exporter okay it goes through the whole channel of banks so it's a very technical complicated process but you should master it on your own if you have problems you can come to me so UCP 600 is just the name of the latest version it's like Windows 10 it's like Windows 10 okay so 600 is like 10 okay so UCP 600 is just the latest version of the documentation that governs this entire intricate process of uh, letters of credit somebody's gonna open a letter of credit some bank is gonna confirm it another beneficiary okay this that uh, advising bank confirming bank is a high technical jargon which you gotta have to we'll just ignore it okay hopefully everyone can hear me um, who wants to come to us uh, can we move Srishti to the front a little bit come and sit next to Tarun can you move in to your right uh, to your left let's move to, uh, Srishti to the front what about Burma can we move him somewhere maybe you guys can come here all three of you uh, Bharat also Bharat and Burma can come this side okay so you're not so much at the back okay all right guys so we were talking about all this stuff that you have to uh, so this entire discussion starts from the sugar contract all right 
when you look at the contract specification so first is the error correction from the previous day the ny bot is not a part of the cme group it's a part of ice okay it's a different exchange okay and this is a very important sugar contract this is called the world sugar contract uh, there's also an american sugar contract so this is and you can see how many growths are deliverable okay against this kind of sugar this sugar contract you can take sugar from any of these countries okay and here i'm just uh, taking off from this point where did we see the fob mentioned here settlement physical delivery fob uh, receivers vessel okay so that whoever is the buyer you have to fob stands for free on board okay so which means you have to load it also so the loading charges also you have to pay okay so uh, one minute So we were talking about the stuff that you guys have to learn on your own, starting off, taking off from this uh, point about the FOB. Okay, so this kind of stuff in quote terms, okay, which means essentially FOB, CIF, CIF stands for uh, cost insurance and freight. Okay, which means you are quoting this price. If you quote this price CIF, if I'm quoting a CIF price, which means this price includes cost insurance and freight. Which means if you are, let's say, a Japanese importer buying from, let's say, an Indian exporter, I'm quoting a CIF price. That means this price is good to take it all the way up to Tokyo Harbor. Okay, because I'm paying for the cost of, cost of the product, plus the insurance on the product, plus the freight charges. Okay, so it'll take you all the way to Port Tokyo Harbor. Okay, so this kind of thing. So this is these things are known as INCO terms. Okay, so this is the whole complex uh, of uh, knowledge that you should pick up. It's all connected. Sale of goods, international sale of goods, UNCISG framework covering that. Okay, then ICC, the important role of the International Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so ICC has uh, arbitration now think they have it in uh, Hong Kong as well but mainly it was in Paris so if there's any dispute on international sale of goods okay it will be governed it will be solved it will be resolved through ICC arbitration okay which mainly happens in Paris okay so ICC will have arbitration which is faster than litigation arbitration is supposed to be faster than litigation so this whole framework is connected then the whole sale takes place under the letters of credit sch scheme okay these are called documentary credits okay the general term is documentary credits okay so this is all connected even if you are a finance manager in a corporation you should understand because most corporations will have some kind of international trade element so this is also something that you have to understand if you are uh, going to be a finance manager in a corporation if you're working in the corporate finance department or the treasury department of uh, any corporation right so this is also so this is a very important body of knowledge which i think actually should be officially into uh, you know inserted into our curriculum because very technical as well so ucp 600 as i said is just the latest with 600 is the version number okay so ucp is uniform customs and procedures okay so essentially ucp is what you should read it at is ucp um UCPFDC, which means Uniform Customs and Procedures for Documentary Credits. So the full form of UCP is Uniform Customs and Procedures for Documentary Credits. So you have the UNCISG legal framework for international sale of goods and the letters of credits uh, system, documentary credit system, okay, uniform, standardized all over the world, makes a lot of difference, makes it very efficient. And they're all governed by UCP 600 right now, okay? Next time you have a different user. Uh, so generally it's the UCP that governs that. That's the UCP uh, Uniform Customs Procedures, Customs and Procedures for Documentary Credits, okay? So this is where you have the entire body of uh, knowledge you pick up all this knowledge okay so you should learn inco terms ucp uh, get some idea of the uncisg uh, you don't have to go into the legal aspects of the sale of goods and all that but at least you should know that this thing exists okay and maybe as a homework you can check whether india has uh, ratified this treaty or not okay so essentially we have to ratify this treaty the parliament has to ratify this treaty okay so whether we have signed up officially for this all right so you can check that okay so the first point essentially that how did i know the sb um so how did i know that sb was uh, the ticker for sugar okay i 
go around the exchanges first I try on CME I don't find the physically deliverable sugar that I'm looking for then I find the world sugar contract it's on the ice web page so you will see product specifications sometimes these are called uh, contract specifications so here they write all the details about the contract okay the world benchmark okay and then uh, this is the name of the product and here's where you find that code SB I remember this because of my familiarity with the contract and this tells you contract size once again contract size uh, reminds you of what concept that we have uh, ha which we have studied very recently lot size correct so contract size is lot size now you can't if you are trading this SB contract on the ice okay uh, you cannot and you notice that the uh, the um, CME group has a cash settled version of this contract which you against which you can't deliver under which you can't deliver but there also you'll notice that the contract size is the same to improve liquidity in that contract to make it you know comparable to the other contract the contract side is the same so 112,000 pounds of sugar so every time you trade so which means again this is your lot size so you can't go to the ice and say I want to trade for 37,000 pounds of sugar I want to buy 37,000 pounds of sugar okay so you have to buy in uh, and the term that I should have used the other day I kept on saying multiples of the market lot actually the word should be integer multiples because technically 1.23 is also a multiple but it's integer multiples of the contract size okay which is the market lot so you can you have to always trade in integer multiples of the market lot so this is the contract size in a futures contract specification page is the equivalent of what we discussed earlier the market lot okay so the price quotation is basically dollars and cents per pound okay so once again you can see here the difference if you set up SB here very small uh, So if I set it up here, essentially you'll see that the price display that you saw on the previous day, on the previous day as well, the price display will be dollars and cents per pound. Okay, in terms of price, so it's 2.7 or something like that. So the so the unit of base asset is one pound. Okay, one the base asset is uh, the world sugar of this benchmark. Okay, uh, this grade of world sh uh, is sugar basically. You can just call it sugar. Uh, and uh, the unit of base asset is one pound. Okay and the market lot is 112,000 pounds is this clear so we should actually add um, in this part where I'm talking about There is a part where I've said that in for any the moment you encounter any market when you're trying to understand what's happening in that market or in terms of the at least the context, uh, the basic rules of that market. I've said at a point of time that for any market. Yeah. Okay. So here I have to actually add one more uh, element. What is that missing element here? I've said base asset terms asset unit of base asset instrument whether it's an OTC market or an exchange traded market. What is the element that is missing here? Market, market lot. Very good. So you should also identify what is the market lot. So when you do that kind of investigation for the sugar contract listed on the ice, okay, you find that the market lot is what have they said here? 112,000 pounds. Okay, which means you have to always trade in integer multiples of the market lot. Is everyone clear so far? Any confusion? Anybody feeling lost in the way that we are progressing? In the initial module, we are trying to study markets understand the basic operations of markets how markets should be organized okay so it's taking a little bit longer for us because we are approaching it from this point of view okay 
we want to have a comprehensive view of uh, global markets so i want to give you a framework that gives you a comprehensive view of global markets because most most finance pro programs anywhere in the world will be taught from a uh, you know from a security analysis point of view okay so which means essentially what they do is they they focus on these two asset classes equities and debt these are the only two markets which are these are the two types of uh, assets which actually should be called securities because these are actually against which these are securities against which companies borrow remember the two part what are the two elements of the liability side of a balance sheet yes debt and equity right two forms of capital debt and equity okay so when you look at capital markets also you'll see it's split into equities and debt we'll be looking at that classification so most you have to understand why our program you have to understand how our program is structured why it's structured in this way because i think that whenever you can get a more uh, you can get a more general framework you should always use a more general framework and there are el large elements of commonality between markets in all asset classes so there's no reason to study finance just from a debt and equities perspective okay so because in many ways debt equity markets are the same as currency markets and commodity markets so you should understand the general principles of markets okay you'll see most of the time students come to me and say i want to study stock markets so i tell them that you should not study the stock market you should study markets in general and then stock markets are a species of market okay a, a one type of asset class so you should always study it from a general as general a perspective as possible that's why this is being taught in this way so that's why we at this stage we are just trying to understand the whole markets landscape how we sh how should we classify uh, the different markets into into asset classes how should we look at instruments what are the types of instruments and then how do markets actually operate okay that's what we are going through right now and in between we will have these kind of detours like i went into this long detour about inco terms and sale of goods and stuff which is where you have to uh, you know study on your own the stuff you have to study on your own okay so um, so i hope nobody is feeling lost at any time if you feel lost you don't understand why we went from this topic a to topic b what is the connection please ask okay instead of being remaining confused always ask questions is this clear to everyone okay you see that in the last uh, at the end of the last video i was uh, praising mithal actually for continually asking questions although initially <laughs> it seemed like i was saying that mithal's question when mithal start asking questions it's like a rapid fire round as soon as you finish one question the next question comes so but that's a good thing that's not a bad thing i'm not please don't get discouraged okay i'm just i, I just found it amusing that so uh, as uh, your questions keep coming so it's a good thing so please don't get discouraged okay all right okay so in between you have this detour now we are going back to uh, this so here we should add market lot so now we go back to the original object uh, what we were studying the other day okay we started on players in financial markets okay so we have this uh, three they have these three high level categories and we have to distinct, distinguish them with respect to what they do to their risk okay so at this point we are not going to break up their total risk we will be later on when we study risk management in detail uh, we will see that this total risk actually consists of the underlying position and the hedge position we're not going to go into that now at this point we will just understand hedgers as people who are looking to decrease risk okay at this uh, first level of the, because right now i really want to get quickly to bids and offers so you are ready to your uh, to do your project okay so uh so hedgers we just think of them as people who are trying to reduce risk okay and this is of course uh, the qualifier is that this means that only if uh, you are actually acting as a, as a hedger sometimes people who should be hedgers don't act as hedgers like we have seen some uh, uh, reports in the press about uh, even some of the indian technology companies these are publicly listed companies uh, where they are not managing their foreign exchange exposures in a very systematic way it's kind of haphazard so sometimes if you don't have a proper risk management policy and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing okay so in that case you may end up increasing your risk but that does not mean that this definition is wrong so the proper if a hedger is actually doing what he's supposed to be doing he should be reducing his risk that's what this definition means okay so sometimes you have cases like there was a company called shoa shell which is actually a subsidiary of uh, a japanese company and, a, and and this dutch company so this guy went and entered into huge numbers of dollar yen foreign exchange contracts which were far in excess of his actual exposure and then he went and lost lots of dollar uh, you know billions of dollars for the company and the i think the company went bankrupt so that's where he was actually increasing his risk which he should not have been doing okay but hedgers reducing risk means this is what you should be doing if you are actually doing what you are supposed to be doing you should not be like breaking the rules and doing improper things okay 
Yes, Shreya, you have a question? Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, so this is what it means. Okay. So at this point, understand hedgers are somebody who's looking to reduce risk. Speculators are somebody who's trying to increase risk. Okay. And arbitragers are somebody who's lying to lock in a profit without taking any risk. Okay. And the risk here that we are discussing in these definitions is only market risk. It does not refer to credit risk, which is the risk that I gave you the example that the furniture guy fulfills his contract by delivering the furniture to my living room, setting it all up. And then I tell him, okay, bye bye. I'm not going to pay you. Okay. So I default on my, I, I don't fulfill my contractual obligation. So that's, he has now basically seen a materialization of credit risk. Okay. So he has a problem now. He has to sue me. So it's a big mess. It'll take a long time. So uh, now uh, this is what we mean. So it's only market risk. Okay. So, so, and then further we are discussed, we are dividing speculators into two parts. Okay. Two categories, directional speculators and market makers. Okay. So why am I giving this kind of, let me first, so, so far is hedgers. Uh, so let me just give you some examples. Uh, arbitrage. I don't want to go quickly and too much into it. Okay. Um, what should we write? Maybe we can write something here. <coughs> we are not going to go because arbitrage is slightly technical. We have to, uh, and this word is also very, uh, you know, uh, it's very often used in the industry in the incorrect sense. Okay, when there is not, uh, when we don't have, so we have to spend a lot more time on arbitrage. But the idea here is that uh, simultaneously, the spelling is wrong. Simultaneously, buy and sell identical asset okay at different i just want to fit it all into one line so i'm writing in short form okay so very shorthand definition of arbitrage we are going to spend more time on it later on but a very shorthand definition of arbitrage essentially is the the simultaneous purchase and sale of the same asset okay so if i find let's say uh, somebody selling gold uh, in in pitampura at say uh, 1500 rupees okay and another person selling gold in maybe uh, gk2 is selling at uh, he's selling uh, and the buying and selling price is the same okay he's selling at 1200 rupees so i buy from that fellow at gk2 at 1200 rupees and sell it to the guy in pitampura i have both of them uh, you know on the phone together and I just buy from him at 1200 and I sell to this guy at 1500. Okay, it's the same asset, it's gold. Okay, it's just that people don't have the right information, so they are quoting different prices. And I take advantage of that difference and I immediately lock in a profit. So I have no market risk left. If these guys all deliver on their contract, then the quantities are the same. Okay, so quantities are the same. And then uh, if these guys both deliver on that contract, I will lock in a clean profit. Is everyone following so far? You get the basic idea. This is the main idea in arbitrage. Okay. So this we are going to call classical riskless arbitrage where you simultaneously buy and sell the same asset. That's what we mean when we say that arbitragers are not looking to take any risk. They don't want to carry any risk. They want to instantaneously lock in a profit. Okay. Hedges. Yeah. You use, use the mic. Yeah, if you can do it, if you can do it, it'll be the same. It will also be an example of classical riskless arbitrage. Okay, so if you see here, now we have ITC here. Okay, 7075, we have ITC here. Okay, now we haven't got to this topic of bids and offers yet, but essentially, if I can buy, let's say this is the NSE price on this software for this feed. We only have NSE feed. We don't have BSE feed. Okay. So if I can buy BSE, if I can buy ITC on the BSE at anywhere less than, and I have to also factor in commissions. Okay. You have to factor in commissions also. So let's say there are no commissions for the sake of argument. Let's just assume there are no commissions. Okay. Uh, then if I can buy an uh, ITC on the, uh, on the BSE for anything less than 271.70, and I can do it in huge volume. Typically arbitrage, you want to do it in massive volume, as high a volume as possible because the profit is guaranteed. So why should I care? Okay. So if I can, you know, I would like to buy millions of shares. So if I can buy, let's say 271.69, if I can buy like 10 million shares of IP ITC on the BSE, and if this price is good for 10 million shares also. Okay. So if that, in that case, then I would buy at 271.69 on the BSE. 
and I would instantaneously sell uh, at 271.70 on the NSE. Okay, so this bids and offer we'll see when you want to sell, you'll have to sell on the bid, and when you want to buy, you'll have to buy at the offer. Okay, we'll get into that. That's actually our next topic. That's why I'm going through this because market makers, these are the guys who are quoting these prices, so that we have to get to that point. But this is your right, this is exactly what it is. Okay, so you'll find that there are so it, the, you will have certain desks set up in uh, certain brokerage houses to do this kind of arbitrage. Okay, and so this again is once again is an example of uh, how people are able to so how arbitrage creeps prices in line okay because as you start doing more and more of this what will happen if you put uh, x uh, if you buy say 271.69 if you buy 10 million shares on the bse for itc what will that do to the buy this is an example of excess demand or excess supply excess, excess demand. demand what does excess demand do to the price price, price will rise okay so that price will start rising from 271.69 and here when you're selling 10 million shares at 271.70 on the nse this is excess demand or excess supply excess supply, excess supply. and what does that do to the price pushes it down okay so then the two prices will tend to converge okay so that's what arbitrage does arbitrage but essentially arbitrage is sometimes also called the law of one price that the same asset cannot have uh, this two different prices okay if it's an identical asset and if you have to you have to equalize the venue of course because sugar in new york you if you you can't buy sugar in new york and against that you sell uh, sugar in, in madras port because then you have to bring the sugar in new york to madras port or you have to take the madras sugar to the new york port only then can you compare the prices okay so you have to compare the freight also so you have to remember it's in the same location if you can bring it to this you have to be able to bring it to the same location okay and then you compare the prices for the same asset this is clear so you get some idea of what arbitrage is and that's why we say that arbitrages are looking to take no risk at all they want to lock in a profit without any risk okay yeah you, you give him the mic whenever you ask a question i get a chance to drink some water yeah so does this happen? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. So his question is, does this actually happen in practice? It does happen. So you will have uh, certain desks which will be set up as arbitrage desks. I'm sure some of the Indian brokers would also have these kind of arbitrage desks, which are meant to take advantage of these kinds of momentary. But you, in general, in a market which is efficient and liquid, where there are many players, you would not expect these kinds of discrepancies to remain in place for very long. Okay, but uh, short answer to your question is that it does happen. Okay, you do have deviations, and that's why you have arbitrage desks which are in place to capture these uh, differences. Okay, but it's a very, uh, it's a because sometimes you need uh, high tech infrastructure to do this as well. Okay, so uh, it's a it's a risky business to get into, especially in liquid and efficient markets, because you know that these uh, these opportunities will not exist for very long. So how much of a return are you going to get on your capital investment and all the infrastructure and stuff like that? But it's something that some desks some uh, some uh, brokers keep in place just to take advantage of uh, these kinds of opportunities but they can arise in fact in the international capital markets we have seen some in the long dated uh, instruments okay like swap spreads and things like that which you study later when you look at swaps they, we have seen some prolonged uh, cases of uh, you know persistent cases of prices being out of line with their arbitrage relationships and they have remained that way because there are all kinds of regulatory constraints on banks and what kind of transactions they can do so remember that prices when they go out of line okay so if the itc uh, the itc price on the bse goes out of line with the nse unless somebody actually uh, with with that on the nse unless somebody actually comes and does the arbitrage there is no force actually bringing the prices together right are you following somebody has to actually come and do the arbitrage transaction to make those prices converge so if you put restrictions suppose the uh, suppose sebi comes and says that bsc as a arbitrage is not allowed some kind of rule like that okay so if you have any kind of regulatory constraint or a capital constraint or something whatever it is something that prevents you from uh, doing the arbitrage okay then of course the prices there's no pressure uh, to bring the prices together there's no force making the prices converge and they can stay out of line okay which is what has happened in some of these cases like swap spreads long dated swap spreads okay which we will discuss later this is clear so far everybody okay make yeah mike mike
Sir, can we actually sell, uh, aren't the shares different like one is traded uh, in NSC? Will it, uh, won't it be different in BSC? Like ITC, NSC is a different stock, I guess. And ITC, BSC is some different stock. So you know, not in uh, cross trade, I guess. No, no, I think that because you have this stuff does go on so essentially what you need I, I what he's getting at is the actual operations of the arbitrage that you have to deliver the shares so if you buy from if you buy on the BSE okay and you have to uh, you sell on the NSE right you buy on the BSE so you have to take delivery when you fulfill the contract you have to take delivery of the shares on the BSE and you have to make delivery on the NSE so because you have sold shares, right? yeah physical I mean, these are not physical shares anymore because remember these are now all yeah. book entry yeah these are all now electronic book entry that's what makes the arbitrage possible but if there were no physical book entry you uh, electronic book entry you would have to physically uh, when you're fulfilling the contract on the settlement date you would have to buy you bought the shares on the BSE you would have had to take delivery of the shares on the BSE and you would have had to because you sold on the NSE you would have had to make delivery on the NSE so you have to physically take the same because remember under in a way forgetting about uh, the uh, electronic book entry system that we have today okay uh, forgetting about that going back to the old ways of the physical certificates okay helps you to understand the question very good question that he has asked he's talking about the actual operations of the arbitrage but look at the underlying asset the underlying asset is the same common shares of ITC in the old days what you would have had is you would have had share certificates of ITC now there are no two ITC companies there's only one ITC company and they have issued common shares okay so what are you getting on the BSE when you settle a contract on the BSE okay you have to just make sure that BSE and NSC are not in different cities so in the old days you would have had them in the same uh, you know if you have them in the same location what you do is you physically take delivery of the ITC share certificates on the NSE on the BSE because you bought on the BSE those share certificates are fungible with whatever you're supposed to deliver on the NSE because what are you delivering you're delivering common share certificates of ITC and ITC has only one variety of common shares because preference shares are not common shares. So taking common shares and ITC, there's only one ITC. So actually the underlying asset is the same. Are you following? Okay. So if you forget about the modern system of, uh, you know, uh, the electronic book entry, but this will make it essentially easier because when we have these, we have these clearing corporations. So there will be a connection between the two clearing houses. Okay where uh, you can you know basically offset one against the other and these brokers will have uh, memberships of both clearing how they'll be clearing members of both the exchanges but you can clearly see that if you go back to the olden days you can clearly see how you can make it happen you you take the physical certificates you run to the NSE and you deliver it there and it's the same asset so there's no problem does that answer your question? Yes, sir. But uh, in ITC, like it's written uh, also over there, ITC and NSC. So when you are trading, like uh, through PWS also, uh, when you are, you have only option of selling and buying. So how will you uh, sell it into BSC? Like you get only option of selling. So you, uh, no, but you press uh, sell, so it sell, uh, sold in uh, NSC only. No, no, but this this particular software because the feed that we have got is only the NSE feed. Okay, but for those who are doing the arbitrage, they would have feed from both the exchanges. They would have feed from both the exchanges, and you would the software would allow you to execute on. Because remember, here when you set up a stock, okay, when you set up a stock, let's say if we set up any stock here, you won't get smart routing. So let me try and set up some other stock, which is let's say Citigroup. Okay, so if I enter C. So if I want to set up Citigroup stock smart, now if you see the smart, the smart is actually talking about the routing part of it. Okay. So your question is now getting into the other question of the venues, which we discussed briefly in the answer to uh, Mitchell's question at the end of the previous video, I think that uh, there's this concept of, in, you can have multiple venues. Okay. So the BSC and NSC are different venues. So you can actually set up. So what you would have in a, in this particular software, because the permissions that we have got, we have only got NSC feed permission. Okay. This, this broker's arrangement is only with the NSC. So their software, we can only see NSC feed, but in practice, you would have for real trading software uh, live trading software you would have the option here smart routing means a smart is actually a routing logic 
okay so the smart routing means that ib will decide interactive brokers will decide where to which venue your uh, order has to be sent for execution so the prices that you see but in fact when you go into the configuration page you'll see later on we can do that once uh, you will see that in the u.s stock market you have multiple venues you can decide to send it only to the island ecn or to a particular ecn or to bats you can decide to send your order to any exchange okay so they give you the option if you don't want to rack your brains with all that routing logic you can just choose smart routing which means ib will monitor the prices on different venues and ib will use its own brains to decide where to send the order okay because the order has to be sent to a particular venue for execution that's why you have the bse and nse are different venues which are trading the same asset okay so you can decide to route your order to the bse and to the route nse so on a software where you have feed from both the locations okay you will set up a one ticker for as you can see here this particular ticker says itc nse if you read i don't know if you can read it because it's very soft print okay but itc this says itc nse this is to tell you that this price is for the venue that we call the nse so later on if you had the option in a live trading software okay uh, with a real money account you would be able to set up bse feed as well so then you would actually do the the buying on the bse feed and the selling on the nse against the prices see this is a feed these bid and offer this is part of our feed we have the feed that's why we can keep seeing these prices okay like you saw in that particular video the instructional video where i decided to buy tcs you would have seen that that day tcs was dropping quite fast so the prices were changing very fast so that's the feed that was coming in okay um, and so here so you would have a separate line like this also showing itc prices but for the bsc feed so you would hit the offer on the bsc feed and you would hit the bid on the nsc feed and that's how you do the transaction and that uh, and the settlement i already explained if you go back to the old days and you imagine it it's the same underlying asset common shares of itc is this clear okay all right okay so we go back so we've uh, done arbitrage okay now hedgers let me give you an example of a hedger and why do we say they want to keep on decreasing their total risk okay so if you think about say saudi arabia okay as so what is uh, saudi arabia you think as far as their position with respect to the since we are discussing oil let's uh, look at the oil price we should actually be using brent for saudi arabia it's closer to their grade but we can use um, west texas just as a so do you think saudi arabia wants the oil price to go up or to go down uh, up right so they benefit everyone is convinced about saloni is not convinced you want them to go you want you think they want it to go up okay all right everyone is convinced sg1 yes, sir. okay what is the problem if the oil price goes down yeah. what is the why are they uh, why wouldn't they like it less profit yeah so less profit margin because they are producers they are, indirectly what you're getting at is that they are producers of oil okay so they may cost i think saudi cost of oil is very low actually i think i don't remember the figure but it's a very low they're one of the lowest cost producers of oil okay so uh, so whatever be the selling price so this is the international selling price the global market sets the international selling price so if the price goes down their profit margin will reduce okay so uh, you can see later on we'll hopefully do a case study where a little case slide where you can see them talking about how the budget deficit in saudi arabia has uh, so the budget deficit in saudi arabia will go up or go down if oil prices fall budget deficit will go up okay because the revenues are falling okay all right so 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 here what we say so saudi arabia is a, and most of their oil has now been transferred to saudi aramco which is the oil company is like their indian oil corporation okay equivalent of that or a ongc so saudi aramco is the company that basically has all the saudi arabian reserves of oil okay so uh, so so these guys now essentially what they are looking to do is so, so they already have certain uh, element of oil okay we say that we can say that we are they are long oil we'll discuss this in more detail when uh, we do hedging and risk management but essentially we say that saudi arabia is already long oil can you see that you remember long and short yes. okay so saudi arabia is already long oil although they haven't actually bought it from anywhere but they have produced it 
So it's like if you see me sitting at home with uh, you know ten ten uh, phones, okay, you don't really know whether I produce those phones or I bought them from somewhere. You know that I have ten phones. So whether I bought them or I whether I produce them, it's the same result. I, I eventually I have these phones and I need to sell them, right? So it's like that. In that sense, we say that uh, you can. There's a better way to think about this, but we'll do. We won't get into that right now. We'll leave it for our risk management module. But essentially, uh, we can say that Saudi Arabia is long oil. Okay. So essentially, what they are looking to do when Saudi Arabia is looking to act, we should be acting. If they're acting properly as a hedger, they should be looking. So obviously, in their long oil now, if the oil price starts dropping, going below like it used to be in the in this period in the mid 80s, all the way up to 2001, 2003 or so. This time they were having a lot of problems. Okay. So on, if it becomes like that once again, if it falls below 30 and all that, 35 and all that, they're going to have a lot of problems. Okay. So as a hedger, they they are always going to try and reduce their risk okay so this is the i'm just kind of giving you an example of what what kind of profile a hedger has so saudi arabia saudi arabia saudi aramco with respect to the oil market is a hedger because they already come to the table with a long position it's not like you guys when you're starting out you have a blank one million dollars in your ibtws and then tarun decides to go and buy itc so he need not have bought anything he could have just sat there for another few days okay he has no obligation he decided to go on take a, go on and take some risk but these guys already by virtue of being saudi arabia and having the oil and doing all their exploration and uh, production activity they are already now naturally long oil now they need to be to reduce their risk they need to be selling oil so essentially so their first hedging activity will be to sell oil okay so that's basically the idea here that this is why we say that the hedgers first transaction should always reduce their risk okay so let's say that they have let's say 100 million dollars 100 million barrels of oil in reserve okay that's their inventory for for the moment okay so and so and they haven't sold this oil to anybody they haven't entered into a contract the moment it entered into a contract to sell 30 million barrels to india then they don't have to worry about that 30 million barrels anymore okay because the market risk is already closed the contract transaction date has already happened 30 million barrels has already been sold to india so on that 30 million barrels they know and they sell it let's say whatever at 60 dollars if they sold it at 60 dollars that means now they know that for that 30 million the actual delivery may happen three months later that doesn't matter okay because you assume here that india will not default on its uh, contractual obligations so delivery may happen three months later but now the team the hedging team at saudi aramco no longer needs to worry about that 30 million dollars because they've already sold it to india okay so contract date is today transaction date is today settlement date will be three months later but already the moment you do the transaction your market risk for that 30 million dollars is gone okay you don't have to, now you only worry about the another 70 million dollars okay so this is what i mean by a hedger uh, when he's acting in the right way he should be the first transaction should reduce his risk okay so the hedger basically when he engages in hedging uh, this is what hedging means so typically when you go uh, when you go outside when you go talk to people in the industry you look on the web and all you'll kind you'll find all kinds of airy fairy definitions of hedging okay but this is a you notice that this is a very objective definition can you see that it's a highly objective is the person acting as a hedger how will you find out whether the person is acting as a hedger assuming you have the information on his overall position okay now if you know instead of saudi arabia we can look at norway what is norway's position similar to saudi or opposite not enough knowledge of the global economy you should have this knowledge norway is the same as saudi arabia another very big producer of oil okay that's why norway norway has one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world it's all that oil surplus which has gone into their sovereign wealth fund so norway is the same position as saudi arabia okay they have oil okay and they have to sell it so essentially when you're looking at a hedger the first transaction will always reduce their total remember see they, they take this example saudi aramco let's say we go back to saudi aramco saudi aramco had the original position was 100 million barrels they were long 100 million barrels anybody has difficulty with this concept that saudi aramco is long 100 million barrels okay at this point we will just use this logic that whether they actually dug that oil from the ground and got 100 million barrels or whether they bought it from Trafigura or some other trader the bottom line is now they have 100 million barrels is this clear so now they're in a position where the price goes up they will make money the price goes down they lose money is that clear 
so they have they are holding on to 100 million barrels, so they're long 100 million barrels so you see how their first transaction this is actually not a hedging transaction the sale to india because it's actually the normal trade transaction a hedging transaction is normally to be thought of as a different way uh, so maybe instead of selling to india let's take it as a classical hedging transaction where they sell instead of selling to india they sell uh, futures contracts they sell 30 million dollars worth of future contract futures contracts uh, 30 million barrels okay so each uh, each uh, each transaction uh, is for uh, the, trans the contract size i think is uh, a thousand barrels okay so you will sell 30 million barrels worth of futures contracts okay <coughs> So the moment this is how a typical hedging operation would work okay the sale to india is not a good example in this context because that's a normally a trade sale that's not to be considered as hedging but if you sell 30 million barrels worth of futures contracts okay now what you've got is a situation where you have reduced your risk because you had 100 million ba barrels okay and we'll look at the operation of futures contracts later but you had 100 million barrels okay now out of that you you hedge 30 million by selling 30 million barrels worth of futures contracts now you do not no longer have to worry now you only worry about the 70 million barrels left so now you've reduced your risk this is clear to everybody this is what i mean by reducing of uh, why hedges reduce their risk okay the first transaction will always reduce their risk okay all right so you'll see later on why i mean uh, why i've said first transaction because later on you can always buy back if you feel that oil prices are going to go higher you can buy back some of those 30 million barrels that you sold that's more complicated we're not going to get into that that's why i've said first transaction we'll see the importance of the definition uh, later on but this is a good way to remember hedgers will always be reducing their risk okay if you forget about the dynamic management of the hedge position forget about that but hedgers at least the first transaction should reduce their risk okay this is the current now you notice that this definition is very technical and very objective nobody can have a different view on this if you know about the background of saudi arabia and aramco and uh, background of norway if you know whether they are originally long or short okay and then you see what they do in the market you can see that you can immediately say that they are behaving as a hedger is that clear to everyone you see it's very objective because your total position information should be known to you and then you see what they do in the market assuming that you know this so it's theoretically possible to know this objectively are you seeing what i'm saying right that if you have the information because you, you can have this information theoretically uh, so uh, that's and then you do you can actually see that they have reduced their risk so they're behaving as a hedger and so therefore this is a hedge transaction this 30 million barrels uh, worth of futures contracts that they sell okay this qualifies as a hedge transaction because it results in the reduction of their total risk are you following everyone is clear okay what logic i'm using so this is how we are defining hedgers speculators i already gave you an example tarun sits with one million dollars uh, one million dollars in his account and suddenly decides if you look at his account okay so he has slightly more than one million dollars okay and immediately he decides now what he decides now there's no obligation for him to do anything he can just sit here and enjoy the interest okay you can see that the um, there must be a position somewhere i think we have a position somewhere okay anyway so suddenly he decides that okay he is very bullish on itc and suddenly he decides to enter a market order and buy yeah okay so this one at least went through quickly if you want to reduce this uh okay so you can actually say can um, change this from the configuration okay so now what has tarun done now see now what has happened to his total risk his market risk has gone up earlier his balance sheet asset side was only cash one million dollars cash now his balance balance sheet is one million dollar cash plus whatever that value of the not one million dollars cash has been reduced the cash position has been reduced by remember before i hit transmit i saw a prompt in the window which was showing on the left hand bottom left it was showing the value of the position okay if you do it once again you'll see what i mean yeah here you see order type market it's another market order right so you can see this is the the value of the position 
so his cash balance converted into view convert this back into dollars his cash balance will go down in this case i don't want to buy anymore i'll just cancel this so now remember the example i gave you earlier his now balance sheet has become some amount of cash but some amount of shares of 100 shares of itc okay now 100 shares of itc the market price keeps changing the market price of cash does not fluctuate that's why we say all cash is no risk okay but the market price of itc shares which is the other asset that he's got on his balance sheet that keeps fluctuating so the total asset value will keep fluctuating are you following now he has got risk now he's got a position everyone clear Shreya, you're not convinced what little bit no there's no little bit either you're 100 percent convinced or not convinced. give her the mic what is she let's find out what she's not convinced about so first step think about this when tarun was sitting on a million dollars of cash asset side is all million one million dollars cash does he have any risk no risk okay now what he has done he's bought 100 shares of itc so his cash balance has gone down by a bit and uh, now the rest of the balance sheet has the other asset on the balance sheet we say that the asset mix has changed okay the asset mix has changed now he's got another type of asset which is 100 shares of itc okay now that has a market price which keeps fluctuating okay so does it uh, has his total risk gone up this is clear everyone is convinced yes you're convinced that his risk has gone up so what was your question so basically speculators uh, why do they want to increase the risk in order to get more profit in future like yes so you have answered that otherwise how will you make money in order to make money sometimes you can engage in arbitrage where you don't take any risk any market risk technically there's some operation risk there is credit risk okay there could be credit risk so but you don't want to take any market risk for arbitrages but speculators generally the first run they want to take risk because they will they want to engage uh, they want to make profits okay that's normally how you make profits okay is this clear okay all right so uh, so you can see how the, this is a classic example of a speculator okay who had whose first transaction has increased the risk okay so now we are talking about the two categories of speculator we have defined speculators. A further distinction made between uh, uh, within the category of speculators, directional speculators, and market makers. Why do I say this? Because there's a reason why. Uh, because you, here you'll understand the difference between the two types of business. Okay, the market making business and and the uh, directional speculation business. So if you look at if you go back to uh, that example of this, let's say when I bought TCS. So in this case, what I did really was, yeah. So I looked at this chart briefly. I hope, uh, yeah. So I looked at this chart and looked like an uptrend to me. And so Aurora was asking this question of why did you decide to buy and not to sell? Now the answer to that question is a very complicated answer. You can either go through FA or uh, fundamental analysis or technical analysis to do that. And we'll spend a lot of time. Most of your finance theory is actually focused on this question like this basic question he had in his mind was there, okay how do i know whether to buy or to sell okay should i buy or should i sell and he was wondering how i decided to buy okay uh, so the answer to that question the proper answer is a very long answer we'll have to send, spend several sessions on that but very briefly i'm looking at it from a purely technical perspective and the reason i buy, decided to buy was that it looked to me like an uptrend that is still going on okay so it's just a decision that when i initially if you remember that day it was falling quite sharply okay it was falling quite sharply but then when i looked at it so i thought we should sell it but then when i looked at the bigger picture it seemed to me that more like an uptrend okay as you can see here this high is actually this high is higher than this high okay it went higher so it's actually being making higher highs and you see this long uptrend here okay it's a continuous uh, and and the other long-term weekly chart also you saw is going higher so i thought that this will basically uh, go higher so therefore um, that's why i decided to buy okay that is just to, just to give i mean the the idea there was not to really give you a detailed uh, 
perspective on how you make the buy sell decision but really rather to show you how to enter orders in that video i was just trying to show you how to enter orders and how to enter stop orders okay so what you should understand here you can see once again if you look at a daily chart from 2013 also it's been going up so i'm just betting that this uptrend will continue okay uh, so you could have decided to go the other way also there's no real way to say uh, other than finally what happens whether you make money or lose money only then you know whether your decision was right okay so but at least you should know that uh, so how did i come to tcs what was the what were we discussed okay right so now why are we deciding so when just like when tarun is buying itc today and i was buying tcs the other day i was also acting like a speculator <coughs> Is that clear? Because my initial balance was all cash. My initial balance was all cash. And I decided to change the asset mix on the balance sheet by spending some of that cash to buy shares of TCS. So I changed my asset mix to some cash and then 1000 shares of TCS. And as you have seen, the shares of TCS have been fluctuating. You can see how much they fluctuate even in this short time, even in this five minutes if you see. So you can see how just in a few days how much it has fluctuated okay all right okay what is the problem why is there so much murmuring there's a mic problem so this is coming from my mic okay so what should oh this uh, it's disturbing you guys okay then let me use that hand mic Actually, we should have told this guy. Was this problem not there when that guy came? I switched it off. No difference. Okay, but why is it so disturbing? Just put up with it. What is it? I don't find I mean I find it irritating as well. Just just ignore it. It's not that complicated. I mean you guys seem to be very soft. A lot of small problems you you get easily uh, distracted and Okay, I don't know what's happening now. Okay, guys, let's not talk so much. Let's be quiet. Just have some discipline, okay? Discipline is the most important thing in the world. If you don't have discipline, I would say you don't even exist. You're like an amoeba or something. You're not even a human being, okay? Discipline is the most important thing in the world. You should always, you know, uh, you know who Sri Aurobindo is? He founded that ashram in uh, in Pondicherry. Okay, so Sri Aurobindo has this very famous quotation. Uh, he says, "All life is yoga." Okay, and the way I interpret it is, yoga is basically discipline. So all through your life, you're actually going you, throughout your day. You are continuously in moments where you really have to control your impulses. Of course, you can't do it all the time, but at least you should keep that in mind that you have to basically yoga is basically discipline controlling yourself to do what needs to be done rather than what you want to do okay so you can't do it all the time but at least you should have that discipline and, and many of the situations i find many of you guys are actually not they're very soft you're easily just lapsing you don't have this concept of discipline discipline is everything in life that's all you need in life discipline okay what is happening with a lot of talking here i have not to now deduct marks for sg1 i have to write it down sg1 and who is his partner ganotra okay so i'm going to write it down the first penalty is because otherwise um otherwise what's happening is nobody is uh, uh, you know sort of engaging in the class all right okay guys let's go back to our discussion very quickly we need to finish this why is everyone clear so far about speculators i mean you understand arbitrages you understand hedges okay how hedges reduce their risk first transaction will reduce their risk 
now let's come to speculators and why am i distinguishing between two types of speculators you are clear you can see easily that uh, in both examples of i mean the example i gave for tarun and for myself when we bought itc at tcs we have increased our risk the first transactions are increased our have increased our risk okay so we are speculators now why i in, i would actually say that in both these cases we are directional speculators okay why are we saying this directional speculators here listen to the look at this now here now i bought tcs here let's go to a slightly longer view you can see the stuff is moving around okay so when i buy tcs here what is my view obviously my view i take a slightly longer term view uh, but the point is that this basically just to move okay let's make it a little bit short okay so my my view that it's actually going above to 2300 much higher than this okay it's going to keep on making new highs remember the moment that you see me buying the moment you see me buying see there are only two types of trends uptrend and downtrend if we ignore the consolidations usually if you go zoom out and see the long term there'll always be either an uptrend or downtrend okay so here there's clearly an uptrend and if i bought what does it mean uh, do i think the uptrend is over or do I think it's not over? It's not, over. not over. That's why I'm buying because I'm a rational person. I want to make money. So you can assume that I'm a rational person. That's a safe assumption. Okay. And you see my actions. You observe that I'm buying. Okay. And you assume that I'm a rational person. Therefore, you assume straight away that this guy's view must be bullish. He must be uh, of the opinion that this uptrend has not ended. Okay. So if the uptrend has not ended. What is the characteristic? What is the definition of an uptrend? higher highs and higher lows okay so if we take a broad view of the highs if we don't want to look into this small up down up down movement here if we just take this high and this low okay and we see that this this low we take this low this high this low again this has gone for a new high okay so we just take this one here here and here but if i believe that the uptrend is still not over it is going to continue higher okay uh, it's going to it's going to remain uh, it's going to keep on progressing okay it will keep on making higher highs and higher lows okay so essentially that means it must eventually go higher than this because this is the highest low highest high so far it will have to go higher than this okay so that's where you basically so this is where you can immediately figure out the person's view if you know what degree of trend he is watching okay you know that in this case i've said that i'm only watching this degree of trend i'm not watching these kind of small views okay this is clear so now you want to so now uh, we'll come to the setting of the stop loss later that's a different question why did i set my stop over here that should also be fairly apparent but we won't come to that right now i'm trying to show you why i'm a directional speculator now what needs to happen for me to make money on this position because i bought it pretty much around here the stock needs to go up a lot okay so there needs to be upward movement so even if i make it small okay even if i make it 15 minutes look at a small uh, even if i'm looking not for not for movement above this but maybe just movement up to 2200 so essentially i bought it around here for me to make money the stuff has to go up right is this clear everyone's convinced common sense it has to go up if it has to go up means it has to be make a directional movement that is a clear directional movement it can't just hang around like this here then i'm not going to make money so when we say though maybe you are a little confused by the word directional it's a new word but there has to be a directional movement in the sense there has to be a clear upward or clear downward movement both are directional movements okay here there is a clear direction here it's not really moving anywhere so there's a directional movement this is clear in order for me to make money there has to be a directional movement okay so that's why we are saying that this category of uh, of uh, trader is this category of speculator the sub category of speculator is called a directional speculator because he is speculating that there will be a big directional move in the price okay you can argue what big or small maybe i take massive position and i play for only small moves okay but let's take a more normal case where you really would like to have big moves to make more profits okay so you want to have a big directional move so in order for directional speculators to make money there must be a big directional move in the price okay i've given both examples of tarun and me i've given examples of us buying but you can apply it the same way for selling also even if i sell i'm still looking for a downward move okay so if i take a stock like say something like tesla okay which is hopefully still in a downward spiral okay so it's going up a little bit here but if i look at right 
so if i look at tesla and i feel that okay this rally will last maybe it will last a little bit more maybe it'll go up to 300 or so i'll wait for here this i'll, I'll sell it as a with a limit order but i'll sell it at 300 okay which my view is let's assume or let's assume that i just sell it right right away here so i'm selling it here okay and i'm going to put a stop over here okay but obviously if i'm selling going short tesla that means i need to have a big directional downward move for making to make money if I'm selling means I feel this is bearish, it will go down eventually. That means my mental projection is, if I'm selling it immediately, my mental projection is that it's going straight down now below all this 150 and all that, right? So therefore to make money, I need a big directional move. So the reason I gave you this selling example is because I want to uh, make it clear that this uh, directional speculation is not tilted to only to the long side. It can be either way. The point is those who are making these kind of trades, they need a big directional move in the price in order to make money. Is everyone clear? The language may be a little bit odd, the directional speculator, but it's clear what I mean by directional move, big directional move, okay? All right, okay, so that's why we call them directional speculators, okay? And we distinguish them, obviously. Remember, one of the rules of taxonomy is, um, where are we? Yeah. So one of the, see here, this again, I've got a class sub classification. One of the golden rules of taxonomy is that your taxa at any, at any level, they have to be mutually exclusive. Okay. So you can't have uh, categories where, uh, you know, person can fit into either this or that. Okay. So essentially I, that means if I put uh, the subcategories of speculators are directional speculators are market makers and market makers, that means the market makers are not directional speculators and directional speculators are not market makers, right? So if I classify everybody into boys and girls, that means the boys are not girls and the girls are not boys. Okay, this is clear. This is a, one of the basic rules of taxonomy. So if you see anybody doing a classification where there is any confusion about this mutually exclusive category, remember mutually exclusive from set theory and all that. Mutually exclusive, right? So that means boys cannot be girls, girls cannot be boys. That's why we have boys and girls categories. Okay, so um, that's what I. So this is one of the basic rules of taxonomy. But unfortunately, you see many cases, even in textbooks, where the taxonomy is not so clear. Okay, so and then uh, it also has to be stuff on the same level. We're not going to get into rules of taxonomy. They also have to be same categories. Okay, like you can't have. Uh, since I'll just briefly tell you another important rule, which is you should not have a categorization which says like Japanese, Germans, Koreans, and, and then the other categories are Bengalis, Tamilians, okay? Because now you're mixing nationalities with like linguistic groups, okay? So you should not have this on the same level. So you can have Japanese, Germans, Koreans, and Indians on the same uh, level, right? And then under Indians, you can have Bengalis, Tamilians, Marathis, okay, are you following? So it goes on a different level. So sometimes you'll see bad taxonomy even in books and all that where they put like different classes on the same level, which you should not do. Okay. So these are the two important rules that you should have only one type of, uh, you know, item on one level and then you should not mix the categories. Okay. They are not, uh, okay. We still have time. We're going to cover. So is everyone clear? I'm calling these directional speculators, the guys who buy and sell typical asset manager, your HDFC mutual fund, buying shares making a bet on shares. It's all directional speculation because in order for them to make money, there needs to be a big directional move. Okay, either way, long uh, selling or uh, either going up or down. Okay, now what are market makers? Okay, why are market makers classified? So here, market makers are not like directional speculators, once again, because they don't require a big directional move uh, in the price in order for them to make money. Let's understand what market makers do. Okay, so in fact, you can go a little bit uh, further down okay and look at this okay see here now we are looking at a market makers price in itc okay which is 271.15 271.20 okay so here the market maker you can imagine this as a market maker quoting the price okay uh, even better is if you look at first the nyse has dedicated market makers but we'll imagine here that there's a market maker making these prices okay so remember so if i want to sell itc which price do i sell at 15 or 20 I would like to sell at 20 but do you think I'm allowed to sell at 20 if I am dealing with the market maker let's say Shivam is the market maker is quoting these prices and I want to deal on these prices and I want to I want to sell ITC on Shivam's prices 
so do I have to sell at 15 or 20 so there doesn't seem to be very clear uh, I mean there, there, there is an agreement in the class on what has to be the thing uh, what has to be the price but this is one thing you have to understand the market maker quotes these two prices at one price at which he will buy and one price at which he will sell now put yourself in Shivam's shoes as the market maker if you are quoting prices to the outside world okay let's here is me it could be also Shuchi coming and trading with him okay anybody can trade he's putting out prices for the whole world okay now look at it from his point of view he has to quote two prices one at which he will buy ITC and one at which he will sell ITC so for him he should offer to buy at uh, 50 he, he should uh, sort of uh, he should want to buy at 15 or he should buy to buy at 20 Shivam, Shivam should want to buy at 15 and he should want to sell at 20 okay so what we say here is that this you see in your notes okay which is essentially bids and offers okay the price at which the market maker buys the base asset is the bid essentially the market price at which the market maker buys because the prices are for the base asset the price at which the market maker buys the base asset okay so market maker these are called two-way prices one at which they buy one at which they sell okay so the price at which the market maker buys is the is the bid and the price at which the market maker sells is the offer okay the prices are always you will know who is quoting the price you are not quoting the price somebody else is quoting the price this is clear he's the market maker he's quoting the two-way price so the concept here to learn is quotation of prices quotation of two-way prices why two-way one for buying one for selling okay and what is bid what is offer okay the price at which he buys the market maker buys is bid the price at which the market maker sells is the offer okay so now obviously now we have we call market makers now the name for them is price makers okay we can also call them price makers we can call them here price makers I, I think I have it somewhere else but we call them price makers okay market makers price makers because we are going to distinguish them from price takers okay so customer here when I'm going and dealing on Shivam's prices I am the price taker I'm the price make I'm the price taker I'm the customer this is clear so far market maker quoting prices quoting two-way prices bids and offers he buys on the bid and he sells on his offer okay this is clear so when I go and trade on Shivam's prices if I want to sell I have to sell at 15 and if I want to buy I have to buy at 20 this is clear everyone is clear now go back and look at money changer prices if you want to go abroad when you guys went to Munich okay you had to all buy foreign exchange so if you bought some cash euros okay makes it much clearer both all prices are shown as two-way prices but you will see when you go to a money changer look at the Thomas Cook page or somewhere okay you will see they have two prices and obviously when you want to buy you pay the higher price when you want to sell you get the lower price okay and that's how these guys make money okay so now you know how Shivam makes money okay so he doesn't want he doesn't want actually now why am I calling him a market maker not a directional speculator because think about his business what does he want ideally ideally what does a market maker want a market maker wants a situation like this he wants us he doesn't want all this kind of dramatic movement okay he wants if you really want to sort of uh, what a market maker wants is kind of like something like this where if you assume that these prices are not very large swings these are actually large swings he wants the prices to remain reasonably confined not much movement okay the ideal thing for him is zero movement and massive volume of trade so about 50% of the uh, customers will be sellers roughly in the long run okay we assume that about 50% will be sellers and about 50% will be buyers okay so Shivam just sits there the whole day and he buys huge amounts at 271.20 and he sells huge amount at 271.25 and that's how they make money so ideally the reason I'm not calling them directional speculators I'm giving a different category market because the focus is very different the business philosophy is very different these guys don't want huge movement so then it becomes very difficult for them to manage because these guys also don't want to take a very strong view on the market they just want to quote bid and offer prices and they want to have massive volume of trade about 50% on each side are you following so that's why you see how the nature of this business is very different because when I buy TCS I have to sit and wait for it to move up okay 
these guys basically wrap up their business in every one day typically a market maker most of the time a classical market maker should be a, like a day trader he should be going home with no position typically if you're going home with a position means you have a problem you have some excess because ideally it will not be 50 50 every day okay so some days you'll have some imbalance maybe you have too much too many sellers so you are okay so you can actually so we can stop here okay and uh, so that you have a nice break uh, okay all right okay so we'll continue this way but i think you understood now make sure you go and revise by now everybody should be clear why i'm classifying market makers as a separate category from directional speculators and market makers said offering to buy uh, opting to buy on the bid okay uh, uh, i don't want to say offering because this is the offer this is the bid this is the offer when you go to trade you always get the worst of the worst of the two prices the worst of the two prices is this clear you buy at the higher price you sell at the sell lower price so please revise these concepts we'll move on to the next one next any technical questions and i won't close the video any technical questions yeah technical question or non technical non technical what is it about the subject matter yeah yeah then use the mic give her the mic i can't hear because give her the mic i can speak like this okay give her the mic because there will be bobbing up in the background yes what is the question you asked that uh market makers are more like arbitrage because they are no risk they are also they don't there is no there is risk because see you what you are asking is market makers are more like arbitrage the answer is no because they do take risk because in real life what will happen is uh, when he's sitting there quoting prices he's not going to get uh, all the time instantaneously uh, 50% of the volume on the bid side and 50% on the offer side and then he's left with a nice profit and no position no in real life what will happen is he will go through a phase where he'll get a bunch of sellers and he'll start accumulating because if everybody goes and sells to shiva then his position in itc keeps building up so he has to look to move his price around a little bit okay or directly go and take a price from some other market maker and sell it so his position keeps building up so this is not a risk free business that's why they have been classified under speculators if you look at it here uh, that's why market makers are classified as a sub category of speculator because they are taking risk see think about this say shivam is sitting there early in the morning no business done okay so i come and sell 5000 shares of itc to him okay at a price of 27145 now his position is his first position is itc now he's gone long itc because i sold to him now what has happened to his, his has his risk gone up or not it's gone up because earlier he had no risk now i came and sold so that's why he's a speculator you see how these definitions are all highly technical very objective and they're always consistent so you'll never go wrong with the definition risk and in arbitrage there is no risk they yeah in, in arbitrage there is no risk in market makers there is some kind of risk yeah market makers that's why they are a sub category of speculator and remember if you are sub category if i've defined all students as people who are carrying textbooks that means whether you are male student or a female student you have to be carrying a textbook and you will have some other characteristics which make you male or female but if you are going to be a student if you are going to be a male student or a female student you must be carrying a textbook because i have defined a student as somebody who is carrying a textbook so therefore if i am this market maker is a sub category of speculator so therefore he must have all the characteristics of a speculator which means his first transaction must always increase his risk which is what you see all the time you start in the morning with a square position then suddenly i come and sell 5000 shares to him now he has got a position his risk has gone up so it's not risk free arbitrage will instantaneously buy itc on the bsc at 27145 and sell it instantaneously on the nsc at 27150 and he has left with no risk no market risk is this clear okay yes next question technical or non technical technical okay yes. so like uh, you were saying in arbitrage uh, you have to take on maximum volume yes no i said in arbitrage the statement i made was arbitrage because it's risk free profit you would always like to do it for as 
as high a volume as possible. If you are giving me free money, five dollars per unit, I would want to do the deal for as many units as possible. So, sir, real life trading, always the volume you want is not like huge volumes are not present in the market. I have seen that in virtual trading you can do it, but in no, no, in the difference between this on this platform. What you see is what you get in real life. That's why on this platform, that's the superiority of this platform compared to some of the other software you're using. Here, all your prices are real prices. What you are selling today, 5,000 shares of ITC, whatever average price you get. At the same time, if a guy was doing a real transaction, he would have also got the same average price through this platform. So everything here is real except for the money. Okay. So this is a full, uh, sim sim I mean, it's a full simulation of, I don't like to use the word simulation because that has a different connotation so yeah but in real life you will get what you get and that's all you can do it for like you can't order 10,000 shares of anything no no who said that I mean if it's there is there like the other day I was trying to sell some shares I think I don't know ITC or something and they said that not enough shares are available for shorting so that's a situation at that point of time so, so if the offer has give this option that, yeah. so this software is a complete replication of the reality that's why you see that when you did those trades it took so long to get a trade done okay here you have this one you can see the decomposition here this one is more uh, yes fewer fewer trades but some of those you saw were huge okay uh, so uh, so that's basically whatever it is that's the reality right yes next why there are price differences in BSC and NSC stocks? Mike, Mike, yeah. Why there are price differences in BSC and NSC stocks? Why? Why there are, you said now that there are price differences in BSC and NSC stocks. No, no, I didn't say there are price differences, I said there could be. Okay, it's not obvious, it's no, not evident. It's not guaranteed to happen, in fact most of the time you would not expect it to happen. If it's happening even though it's momentary maybe. Okay, my new time. Huh. So in this case, maybe what might happen is this is 65, 70. That might be like, well, here you don't have that kind of difference. It has to be 5 rupees. But it might be, if you don't have that constraint, it could be 66, 71. But at 66, 71, I can't buy at 71 and sell at 66 and make money. So the opportunity is not there. So in general, you don't expect big differences in a liquid market. And uh, even if there are some differences, it may be momentary, there may not be an opportunity for arbitrage. See, if the price here is 70 75, yes. and the BSC price is uh, 75 80, BSC is 76 81. Uh, of course, it, here we have a 5 rupee difference rule, but let's assume that rule doesn't exist. Okay. So it's 70 75 NSC, 70 80 NSC, 71 81 BSC. I can't make money, I can't do arbitrage. But if I have to buy at 81 and sell at 71, I'm not making money. Not so, minute differences, momentary differences, not enough to make money. That's what you would normally expect in a liquid market. Now, if you have illiquid markets, that's a different story. But then, illiquid markets, even for an arbitrager, that's risky. Really, illiquid markets are all these Falco stocks that you get, all these Banana Republic stocks, small stocks, thinly traded stocks which many of the brokers might want to push sometimes that's why i told you that if you're trading if you're trading that's why i gave you guys a golden rule if you're trading indian stocks do not go outside the nifty 50 period no need Mike, Mike. Sir, in stock, in stock market, there are many uh, buyers and sellers. Sir, if, uh, Mike, use the mic properly. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Sir, in stock market, there are many buyers and sellers. So, if there are few prices being quoted, but one is a better button for us. So, whose price is being quoted here? So, obviously, there are many bidders. No, this is the, yeah, very good question. You are talking about the best bid and offer. Yes, so, sir. a platform like this is actually aggregating prices from different venues. How, sir, how is this aggregation has been happening? It's a, that, that's programming. You just write software for that. You awesome. aggregate prices from different venues. Okay. Hmm. Say, let's say Kushbu is bidding 91. Hmm. Okay. So you are bidding 93. Then uh, Sakshi is bidding 95. They find that Sakshi's bid is the highest. Uh, so they'll show 95. Uh, uh, so explain David, show the highest bidding price. And it's called the best bid and offer. Uh, 
बेस्ट बेड ऑफर है सो द हाईएस्ट बेड लोएस्ट ऑफर लोएस्ट ऑफर बेस्ट बेड सो व्हाट यू से देयर आर प्राइसेस बीइंग कोटेड ऑन डिफरेंट प्लेटफॉर्म्स सो हाउ डू दे डिसाइड हाउ टू कोट दिस शो दीस प्राइसेस सो द लॉजिक इज दे एग्रीगेट दे पोल एवरीबॉडी इन द क्लास दे पुट इट दिस कोट ऑफरिंग 11 Okay, but maybe uh, Tanya is offering ten, so they will not show Puneet's offer because his offer is higher. High, high. They will show the lowest offer, lowest offer, and they will show the highest bid. So mechanically, it's as if you go around the class and ask, "Hey, what's your bid? What's your bid? What's your offer? What's your offer?" What's your offer? And, and then you take the, the highest bid and, and the high, the high lowest offer. offer. That's uh, called the best bid and offer. So can you software show uh, five, five bid or the five? Uh, yeah. Now you're getting into the concept of market depth. We'll have to see that. Now we'll do that another day because you have to. Uh, so we'll. You're getting in, what you're getting into the concept of market depth. You can try it on your platform. Why don't you experiment it? I think we have that. I have been interacted with Tolensi software. I don't. I I didn't know. I didn't work on that. But uh, someone was working on it. So there were actually five. Oh, price for US dollar. No, no, that is Book Trader. Let's try Book Trader and see if we have that on ITC. But you try Book Trader on your own. I don't want to try. See, see now you can see. Market depth. I was going to come to that. This is what ITC. Yeah. Now you are getting what you wanted. Yeah. Now, now Mr. Mitchell is happy because he has got what he wanted. Now you are getting to see the market depth. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are. That's why they are showing you two seventy nine ninety five because there all you have people. Monit is bidding five thousand shares at two two seventy one seventy five, but he's not at the top of the book. So we'll do this next class, top of the book. Okay. So you can see it. You can practice on your own. Okay. Everybody's software isn't working. We forgot to ask that question. Is everyone's software working now? Yes, Tarun. Everyone's software is working now. All groups. Yes, sir. Please make sure that nobody has any problems. Please start practicing. Okay. Clear. One minute. Now let's close the. No, no, no. We won't close it. Quickly, quickly. Tell me. You have given us three logins, right? Yeah. So, uh, and one is one is one is for uh for for a project. Yeah. So we have only two logins for our. You want more? You want more? I want one. Okay. Anybody? Please convey to the team. Anybody? I have some extra logins. Anybody who needs extra logins, please write to me. Yeah. But you already have two logins for practice. So people are more demand. So like you have more demand, excess demand. There is excess demand for logins. So price of logins will go up. Okay. So I have some extra logins. Whoever needs logins, please write to me. And don't demand extra. Like we will take extra food, no? Just because I'm worried that you know somebody else will take it. So only ask for what you need. Okay. Yeah. Please write to me, and then I will send you the logins. Is that clear? Yeah. I'll try to write. I'll wait for. Please tell everybody quickly to write to me by today itself, because I will distribute the logins today. Okay. All right.